Kings. I don't even need to say, I've just got an information that just my photo with him is trending in Malawi like crazy. <laughs> But I have a confession to make. I say things as they are. So if anybody gets offended, I am sorry, but that's how I'm born. <laughs> People have articulated the great Azikiwe's story, where he was born, and so on, his story. I will skip that and talk about this great man as Africa knows him and what I think he stands for. You see, we shall as a gentleman, I'm in the habit of getting to a place for the first time and finding what I can learn from that country. During the elections of this country, I was privileged to be requested by America to lead the observer team of NDI and IRI. I don't know why, but they just felt this African woman will lead this observer team. While I was here, Arise Broadcasting Channel asked to interview me. One thing I learned for the first time in Nigeria, the question that came from the anchor was, what about vote buying in Malawi? And I said, what is that? <laughs> because distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I had never heard about vote by in my life. Where I come from, the last elections of 2020, the sitting president used the tickets to change figures. Our award-winning judiciary nullified the election. <laughs> So when I went home, the interview we have with Nigeria was, I told them about this question, and Malawians were abused. We learn every day. What by? Today, now to my speech, I have decided that I will broaden my thing. We will touch a lot of issues at the end of which I will ask questions that it will take home because Africa needs answers to the issues that are affecting us. Nobody is going to come into Africa to do this for us. We must do it ourselves. And the Zik of Africa, the great Zik of Africa, led the way. Today, 16th of November, is not an ordinary day. Nadia as would have been 119 as you've heard already. He died at the age of 91 in May 1996. We are here to honor the life of a gallant fighter for human rights and justice. A man that embodied humanity and servant leadership. A man who we are and have continued to celebrate the great Askiwe of Africa. We are also a few weeks away from October 1, the day that he became first president of the Federal Party of Nigeria, 1963. A formidable journalist, change, political activist and president, whose leadership acumen made the colonial powers try in vain to block his ascendancy to the president, to the presidency. I have therefore always wondered why, when we talk about our revolutionary leaders, our founding fathers, we will mention Nguyenene, Kaunda, and we mention Mandela, and often they leave out as Kiwi. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is your duty as Nigerians to amplify this name. This is no small name. As Kiwi was a great man, just as great as everyone else, nobody is going to do it for you but yourselves. I'll give you an example of what I did myself. Kamus Banda was attended the first founding meeting of the Organization of African Unity. And in 2013, we were celebrating 50 years. And I got to the African Union headquarters 
age because he's the great son of this continent. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, these are the saints are a befitting celebration of an African child who through the power of his pain and paper here in Nigeria, Ghana and across Africa, before independence, gave us a platform to identify ourselves as proud Africans and consciously ignited the flames of colonial liberation across the many colonized countries of the African continent. And please follow me. I'm going to talk about women of Nigeria. And I want us to keep in mind that the women of Nigeria, of Malawi, of South Africa stood up with their brothers to fight for self rule. We were not just to hold. I'm therefore honored to be here as we celebrate Nanda's poor ladies. I'm also humbled that it pleased the community for me to consider me to be the first woman leader on this lecture series. I hope many more women leaders in various sectors of our African societies will have this honor and privilege to share their thoughts and join the rest of the continent in celebrating the great sleep of Africa. I am grateful to Senator Ben Niwami for traveling all the way to Malawi to come and request me to come here to this And I'll tell you why. I had to come a few years before for the invitation of a certain foundation. And I was treated very badly. Somehow, in other countries, when we, when we go, they want to treat us differently from our male counterparts. But what I, I didn't realize that I was mistreated until a fellow Nigerian woman came and told me, do you not say anything different? I said, no. In one hour, it was rectified. But then I made up my mind, I was never coming back to Nigeria as speaker. So when he, uh, Chief Senator wrote to say he was coming to Malawi and told me what it was about. My husband said, Oh, I thought you were never going to go to Nigeria again to speak. I said, Yeah. Well, but he, my, my brother Chief came to Malawi anyway. And when he said, Well, we want you to give a lecture on as a Kiwi, not as a Kiwi, the first to jump from his seat was my husband looking at me. Because this is a great man that we honor, even in that part of Africa. The Secret Service and Gentlemen, this presentation I will interrogate and the, the intersection of current state of development in Africa, governance, climate justice, and other development related issues that I think require our attention and action. So I have seen my discussion with reclaiming this world, climate justice and Africa's sustainable development. I, I deliberately added the sustainable development because we are going to go on a journey this, this afternoon. Bear with me, please don't go. We have issues to rectify. As Africans, nobody is going to do it for us. Allow me then to start by going into the history of Africa. We were colonized by something like 80 plus years as African countries. And for all those years, we produced raw materials for Europe and what I call the global north. And in the meantime, they emitted emissions and destroyed our climate. And as it turns out now, it is the global south that is paying the price. That is what we must bear in mind this afternoon. Colonization still has a bad taste in our mouths. Take a throw after our hero, like Ziki, to stood up and demanded what belonged and still belong to us, which is freedom and our wealth. It has been added in other quarters that time is past. 
for us to keep blaming some of African challenges and state of affairs on colonization and any and that ended decades ago. There's a case to be made either way to distinguish ladies and gentlemen. Most African states are really independent from their colonizers. As to what extent that independence means, remains debatable. We have seen some foreign, former colonial powers continue to control how we should lead our lives and in the process cause economic and political instability. You have heard of the pact for the continuation of colonization applied in some West African countries by the French government, through which they are bonded to colonial power, including control of their hard earned reserves. In 1947, the pact this, this 1947 pact has just been renewed two years ago to further enhance the colonial master's hold and control of those countries. Can we therefore say the whole Africa is free? Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this pact was designed to help France maintain control over its colonies. I therefore hold the view that unless we rise and fight together, as the governor said, stand united, we are not completely free. These are facts that one cannot wish away. This is it a fact as well that when the colonizers left, starting with Ghana 1957, they left the broken education systems, broken health systems, agricultural systems that were in tatters, that we had to start from scratch with zero resources. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, therefore, colonization, industrial revolution, looting of African resources are interlinked, but have also led to climate change. I don't have to remind this audience that through colonization, Africa powered the industrial revolution and continues to power their economies, even now. We as a continent are paying for sins we did not commit at all, but emanating from our being colonized. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Africa's sustainable development or lack of it, therefore, is directly linked to climate change. Africa continues to be at the receiving end of climate change effects, with countries in the global south greatly affected by severe drought, floods, destructive storms that are tearing down infrastructure and sweeping away crops, leading to economic and political instability in some countries. These are countries that are already struggling to recover from global economic shocks. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, climate justice is therefore critical to holistically address challenges that most African states are encountering in their efforts to attain sustainable development. The global north, as the highest emitters of greenhouse gases, has a moral and financial obligation to help developing countries, and particularly Africa, mitigate global warming effects. By the way, because of the noise I've been making on this matter, in April of this year, I was appointed the Pan-African Justice, uh, Climate Justice Champion to amplify our African voice on the loss and damage agenda. From here, I've been invited by the President of Angola to go and discuss peace in Africa. From there, I've been invited by President Ramaphosa to go and interact with our male counterparts. But from there, I'm going straight to Abu I want to sit there when we discuss climate justice. So climate 
Change is no longer a theory or a future activity. Climate change is no future tense. It has no future tense. Climate change must be discussed in the present tense. It is a current norm and we must aggressively mitigate or adopt to the changes to sustain our generation. We have a responsibility to preserve our future and our children's future. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this then brings me to the issue of wealth, natural resources. We are told that as a continent we hold 30% of the world's minerals. And I have argued that we may have more, even more than us. But yet, we have some of the poorest nations in the world. We, in state houses, those of us who call ourselves presidents and governors and leaders, must tell ourselves every day that the natural resources of our land is God's gift to his people and they don't belong to our pockets. My appeal to my fellow leaders is that first, we must inform ourselves that that wealth is not ours. If our country has diamonds, it belongs to the people. It's not ours. And as leaders, we are just custodians of that wealth on behalf of the people that we lead. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this is a famous quote everywhere in the world that Joyce Banda of Malawi once said, leadership is a love affair. You must fall in love with the people you serve, and the people must fall in love with you. If that is inculcated in your mind, if it, is, it sinks, you will not touch a single diamond that belongs to the people. We also have timber, we have the guns, we have fetal agricultural land, and the lot, lots of thermal and solar power. We as a continent are therefore not poor. I have dreamt of a day when such resources shall be used to uplift people's lives. Providing them with clean water, easy access to health facilities, and education for their children. I still have that dream that we shall bring meaning to our political independence. I also look forward to the day when African leaders shall learn to protect this wealth on behalf of their people. Just like Botswana. I think I've seen a letter from Botswana. In Botswana, when you get into that country, you don't even see a single diamond anywhere. It is highly protected. But you can hear every day that is, Botswana is one of the richest countries on the continent. They, they have the highest reserves. And I pay tribute to Botswana's founding father, Celeste Kama, who when they discovered the diamonds, he made sure there are measures put in place that it shall not be easily accessible. And this sitting president now, I'm told he has said, no export of our raw diamonds, but also investors that want to come and invest in, in, in mining in our country, 50-50. You are not going to exploit Africa all the way from wherever. You are going to come and it is going to be 50-50 with the people of Botswana. So when somebody in Botswana gets land, you will go to the government to get a tractor. And then he will go and, and, and farm. And he will go back to government to get seeds and fertilizers free. And he will send his child from standard one all the way to university free. That is what I'm talking about. When a country is rich, the wealth belongs to the people and the leaders must ensure that people are enjoying that wealth. I have always imagined that if we, as a Kiwe, Dr. Nani as Kiwe had been alive, this is the kind of leader we were going to have. Unfortunately, his tenure was cut short. 
And me as a politician, I do understand, oh my God, you don't know what we do to each other in politics. But I wish he had been given enough time because he had laid the foundation for the prosperity and unity of this country called Nigeria. It is pleasing to note that African countries like Zimbabwe and Ghana now have taken the necessary measures to impose strong regulatory measures on exploitation and exploitation of their precious minerals. As a continent, we must be vigilant and stop these old and late night floods that land in forests, air, air streets, and fly out with our precious stones to unknown destinations. Mm. I don't know if you know this, but there are some countries on the continent when you fly, you see strips, air strips, and they will come and land at night and load. Nobody knows whether with the, with the knowledge of the leaders, but they are able to land, load, and leave the country. Here in West Africa, one country has demonstrated that if you change that narrative, if you take control of your minerals, you can become one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So, this should be inspiration for us. This should encourage us. We are a rich continent. We are a huge continent with abundant arable land. That's why sometimes I laugh when I see the map of Africa against the world. They, they put it, they squeeze it so that it looks small. I don't know why they're aiming at us. They must be thinking we have no brain. But we have a continent where America, Europe, and India can go in all at once. Hmm. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is heartbreaking that in spite of this wealth, Africa continues to lose her resources through illicit financial flows. The African Union in 2012 commissioned a, 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 a survey under President Becky. It is called the Becky Report, where they had to look at how our money is moving from one place to another. It breaks my heart that African leaders are called corrupt. But then, when our resources leave at night by planes or through this report, they are not, those, those minerals are not going back to Africa. So this is a situation where we all must take responsibility. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Mbeki report identified that multinational corporations are the biggest culprit of illicit outflows, followed by organized crime. That's why we have to be vigilant. We have unfortunately weak governance capacity in most of our countries, and this has created a favorable environment for illegal business to thrive, the panel added. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, This raises some questions on my mind. One, why is it that our African leaders, we African leaders, are not raising our voices on this malpractice and call for immediate action by the African Union to protect our African wealth? Natural resources that are also key in the implementation of our own governing agenda. Number two, and this baffles me even more, these illicit outflows from Africa are domiciled in the West and some tax havens. Why isn't the West aggressively pursuing these criminal enterprises and be true partners in Africa's social and economic development? by returning that money back to Africa. Countries continue to struggle to get the money back that was illegally externalized into overseas banks. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the foreign countries 
I was laughing the other day. They have even got the audacity. When they return the money to the country, they ask the money, the country, how are you going to use it? How did you use it? You must be accountable. Oh, you were not accountable in the first place when you took our money. You see this, ladies and gentlemen, all this makes me wonder, why do you great as Kiwe have done to correct this injustice? Why is it that our generation isn't moved to stop this illicit flow for the sake of the general good of the Nandi Azikiwe legacy. As a continent, we are not just losing these huge resources. This corruption and illegal acceleration of our resources is a direct contribution to the current suffering of our people through economic stagnation, squeeze the fiscal space for infrastructure development and natural disasters. On the point of natural disasters, Malawi this year has had devastating, had been devastated by cyclone Fred that left over 1,000 people dead and 2 million people displaced. The president of Malawi appointed me goodwill ambassador for the reconstruction, the post cyclone Fred reconstruction. So we are building houses and we are distributing food. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, discussed, and what I have discussed so far, shows that there's a direct impact on all these challenges on our women and girls. Men as well, but they have told us that the face of poverty are women and girls. As we speak, and I don't know how this is acceptable, as we speak, 50 million girls are out of school in Africa alone. They are abused, they are overworked, they get into any marriages, hence, highest victims of maternal death. I don't even want to go into harmful traditions that the children face, these poor African girls. If it is in Malawi, they are crazy by age nine. I don't want to go into what cleansing is because to make us sick. If it is Kenya, they are mutilated. If it is Nigeria, not only are they mutilated by the preference of a boy child is killing us too. When you are married, it is expected that it's better to have a boy than a daughter. And you panic as a woman that it be a boy. <laughs> if it is a girl, it's not my fault. Go and read science books, it's not my fault. But these are the challenges and the traditions that will happen in all of Africa. If it is in Ghana, then maybe it is a uh, trouble. And they banned this practice in 1995, but we still have 1,400 1, women still in the bush under the trouble tradition. If it is Cameroon, then this child by age 10, breasts are coming out. Then it is breast tiny. I was talking to a girl in New York. I said, let's go back to Cameroon and fight breast tiny. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, well, when the breasts start coming out, they take a hot rod and they press on your chest. And she said, ah, is that what my mother was doing to me? Up until that time, She's a university graduate, she's working, she didn't know she was breast ironed. We had to phone her mother. They are then who are needed to say, well, it's tradition. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, equally, women are critical human resource on the continent of Africa. And it is a resource that is in abundance. Women are the majority of the African population and are critical players in both formal and informal business sector. I have always said, and when I said this in, Nam in uh, Namibia, when President Nioma was guest of honor at a business forum, I said that I caught myself. In our African traditions, 
where men eat first and best and most. Men have become the primary beneficiaries of our economic activities. Therefore, our brothers should help us excel in business because at the end of the day, when we do well in business, our family enjoys better health, better education for our children, and better nutrition. My fellow women will be crying, trying so hard as it turned out. What they had sent me to come and discuss with President Buhari a year and a half ago was 6%. And President Buhari said, Madam Joyce Banda, we will take the bill to Parliament. And our distinguished president did just that. And the bill ended up in Parliament. And it was thrown out. So what do we do? As long as women are sitting out of that August House, who is looking at issues that affect women and children? Communities. Because where they come from, there are no opportunities. So they end up in South Africa. South Africans end up in Morocco. And Malawians end up in South Africa. And they're subjected to xenophobic instances. They are killed, they are beaten. They are even dying swimming to Europe on the Mediterranean Sea. So this is a call on my fellow leaders to say we are obliged to create opportunities for our young people. They have been raising their voices for a long time. We are not listening. And if we are not listening, you know what will happen? While we are comfortably sitting in the state house, another leader will be made for the marketplace. We shall not even know what beat us. Because they are not playing. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, leaders, we have agreed the wealth in our countries is not ours. So, if it is Nigeria, Botswana, Malawi now, it has the largest deposits of root time. When we get that out, it doesn't belong to any leader, it belongs to the people. Our own citizens must feel that they are rich and from a rich country. Illicit movements of our wealth out of Africa can be stopped. And the African Union and ECOWAS must get involved in this matter. And the countries are running to us for help to resolve the pact for the continuation of colonization. And instead of helping them, we are condemning them. It won't help. It's counterproductive. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, what these countries in West Africa need is support, not condemnation. Our institutions should be in place and take action as soon as possible. Now, President Tusekeda of DRC has announced that I don't want peacekeepers in my country. So, Nigeria and Africa, a great place for our children. Thank you. Thank you.